Welcome to the Jay and Rob Show. I'm your host, Rob McCallum, a.k.a. Rob McZob, but there's only one of me, and the title promises two people. So let me introduce my brother and cohort, the Mumra to my Lino, or maybe the Lino to my Mumra, Mr. Jay Bartlett. Would that imply that we're immortal enemies? We're just always talked about in the same sentence. Fair enough. What's going on, brother? How are you? I'm doing well, and I'm excited to talk toys, and I hope you're ready to dive right in. I am. Let's get into it, man. I can't wait. Good. Let's dive right in, then. Let's talk exclusives. Now, when I say exclusives, we're talking exclusive action figures that have to be picked up at specific retailers, at specific conventions, uh, mail-away figures, or even online exclusives. So what's the first feeling or thought that comes to you when you start thinking about action figure exclusives? Oh, man. A anxiety. 100% anxiety. I don't like that feeling. This weird kind of pressure that kind of bubbles up from inside, and you're just trying to wonder, how am I going to find X figure? Retailers are bad enough trying to find these figures, but con exclusives, oh man, anxiety goes right through the roof. So for you, is it a fear of missing out, like you're like you're not gonna get it, or is it a fear that you're gonna have to spend too much? Where is this anxiety really coming from? I wouldn't say it's the spending. That's not really the problem. The problem is where we're gonna find it. We can use uh, the Beachhead exclusive that was a Target exclusive in the States only. Here in Canada, we don't have Target. So right away, it's like, okay, how am I gonna get this thing? Obviously, it's gonna have to be an eBay exclusive. We'll, we'll get back to that term because that's one of my favorite ones that you've coined. Let's take like a broader approach to, to exclusives. What are the pros and cons? Let's, let's start on the positive note. What, what are the pros of having exclusives, whether it's at a retailer, at a convention, uh, online? Where, what are the things you love about exclusives, Jay? The pros, first of all, from a business standpoint, because that's the first thing that popped through my head, obviously you want to attract people to your, your chain, right? So Target, people are going to go there to get the exclusive. PowerCon, they have to go to PowerCon to get uh, the He-Man Masters of the Universe exclusive. So business, it's always good for business. The pro for me, I guess it would be bragging rights because it usually takes a lot more effort to get these exclusives, right? Am I right or am I right? So <laughs> when you achieve that trophy, you get to kind of put it on your shelf of power, so to speak, and kind of you know show it off to all your fellow collectors. It's, it's not a competition, Jay. It's not about the size of your collection. Your shelf doesn't have to be bigger than my shelf. Or you, unless that's what makes you feel good and sleep at night. The bigger <laughs> your shelf, the better you sleep. I, I don't know. I think some of the pros are that you usually get like figures that you wouldn't normally get. I think the vast majority of, of figures that are, that are released for exclusives are some of those deep cut figures. The stuff that you love, the guys that are in the background, uh, the, the people that are, you know, become those, you know, cult classic favorite characters. It's like, oh my God, they're finally gonna do this version of Cobra Commander or, or something along those lines that you just never expected to see because it's such an obscure reference. Thus, it's exclusive to something like Comic-Con, say, where only the true fans will get it, and thus it's a short printing, thus it costs more to get on the aftermarket. I think it's a huge pro because it allows the brand to go in some of those deep cut you know, directions and really fill in all the corners for any possibility of characters. I also think one pro of that is, is it kind of keeps the word of mouth going. It's like, oh, did you hear about this figure that's coming out? Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's exclusive over here on, on Target or on Walmart or, or on Amazon. And that's always exciting. But I think to your point, we'll start talking about some cons. The excitement quickly leads to anxiety. So what are some of the things that you do not like when it comes to exclusives? I don't like the feeling that you're not 100% gonna get it. That's, it's just, that's where the anxiety stems from. It's like, okay, uh, you know, after a HasLab conference online, it's like the Storm Shadow is gonna go exclusive on Amazon. That's great. So everyone is kind of, you know, has the Amazon tab open waiting for the conference to end. And then it's just this mad dash. More often than not, just like concert tickets, the, you know, the internet freezes or you're in a queue with everybody else and you have like two minutes to check out. It's just a lot of stress and I really do compare it to buying uh, concert tickets in modern day. I couldn't agree with you more. What I call this is fan punishment. 
You know, the, the brand is out there, they get people excited, you're buying wave after wave, you're, you know, you're checking multiple stores in your own, in your own town or you're pre-ordering stuff and sometimes waiting, you know, a year to a year and a half for these. They've hooked you as a fan. Okay, you've given me a little bit of the drug, I wanna complete it, I wanna finish it. Oh, but wait a second, little Johnny or little Jenny, you can't have this one because you couldn't get to this part of the world where this big fan convention is and you can't finish your shelf unless you're a fan and you gotta get to this convention. And it's just like punishing you for liking this thing and for like supporting the brand which allowed the convention to have this exclusive figure that now you can't get. It's really frustrating, especially if you fall into that completist trap where, oh, I can't get this now, or if I wanna get it, I have to pay two or three times the price, if you're lucky, after the fact. It's, it's really kind of unfair that they don't cater to the fans and at least make a pre-order opportunity to give people the chance. You know, maybe it is more money than the average figure, uh, but at least give fans the chance to say no rather than remove the opportunity to purchase whatever the exclusive is away from them. That sucks. That, that completely turns me off a line or, or a brand when I can't have that thing. And it takes a lot of passion for whatever the line is for me to stick in it when those things happen. How do you feel about that? I couldn't agree with you more, actually. I'm gonna reference the G.I. Joe Classified that came out in the last couple of years where there was a ton of exclusives to Target and to Amazon, like, like I'd uh, referenced earlier. I finally completed the Target exclusive Cobra Island figures, and I got the Storm Shadow from Amazon. And I gotta be honest, I'm just really not that interested because trying to track down these retail exclusives in a country where Target doesn't exist anymore was so frustrating. Now, luckily, Canada still has Toys R Us and those Cobra Island exclusives came to Toys R Us, thank goodness. But just the anxiety that went along with getting those four figures, it's its really turned me off to be quite honest. And it's, it sucks, man, because I love the classifieds, but I'm just, I need a break from that rat race. Yeah, so let's compare and contrast a little bit. I've been talking kind of about conventions where Comic-Con will have an exclusive or PowerCon will have exclusive figures or Joe Fest might have exclusive figures for, for whatever brand or, or line that you want. You have to go to a show that's you know a weekend long event to get the figure. That's one kind of exclusive. Another kind of more recent years, especially with how toy aisles have been changing at big box retailers, are the retail exclusive. These figures will only be at this retailer very specifically. Masters of the Universe Origins for one whole year was only at Walmart. It was a Walmart exclusive brand. Uh, after that first year, it, it goes wide and goes everywhere. We're also seeing some figures within the line only go to certain retailers. You're talking about G.I. Joe Classified. Certain figures are, are Target exclusives only. So if you want mm -hmm. that figure, you better walk your way into Target because Target paid extra money to get that figure as a draw for the fans. I detest retail exclusives when they are main characters. You mentioned Beachhead. I will say Splinter and Baxter, the cartoon NECA TMNT two pack was a Walmart exclusive. Are uh, you kidding me? Splinter, a major character, yeah. and it's only at Walmart in the States. Oh, it's ridiculous. I mean, it could have been Target. It doesn't matter. The point I'm trying to make is that you take two core characters, even Baxter I would consider a core character because it was part of that first 10 back release. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or 12 back release or whatever it is from TMNT. And then you say, okay, fans, you have to do this. It's not like it's a deep cut or a B or a C character where people could go, hmm, okay, either way, it is a complete draw. And I get why the retailer wants to claim exclusivity to that. But at the same time, these toy designers and these manufacturers should be kind of thinking about the fans. I think that there's much more thought towards retail and, and the big box stores and them making money than it is about the fans who will support these lines no matter what. Well, of course, of course. And, and look at the big companies that have them, Walmart, Target, it's the two biggest retailers on the planet, right? So of course they're gonna throw a wad of cash at Hasbro or Mattel or whoever and say, here you go, we wanna carry, you know, Battle Armor He-Man. I'm just throwing that out, it's not, but I'm just throwing that out as an example. We want that character, here's all this cash. And Mattel and Hasbro, no matter how much money they have, they want more money, they're not gonna say no to that. Where I think the real problem is, is nobody's monitoring these resellers. So not only are these exclusives and the figure lines in general difficult to get, 
but the resellers, and they have every right to do this, so don't get me wrong. I don't have to like it, but they have every right to do it. They come in and they're clearing the pegs clean. So not only are they getting all the exclusives, they're getting all of everything. That's why you see in all these toy groups the last few years, people you know, taking pictures of Walmart and the pegs and there's nothing there. Walmart and these retailers have to be more responsible and just say, okay, one of each figure, one of each character in each line, that has to be regulated because it's not fair. Well, we're starting to see some regulation, thankfully. I know a lot of people in the Joe groups particularly and the TMNT groups online are posting, you know, limit two per customer, which is really nice. And it's also nice to see some camaraderie in the community where people are saying, hey, I'm at Walmart. If anybody's around, I'll be here the next 10 minutes. Just hit me up on Facebook or Twitter if you're looking for something and I'll just ship it to you at cost to combat exactly what you're talking about. But you would also think if the pegs are, you know, pick clean, how come they're not ordering more? Because the retailer, all they care about is the sale. They don't care about the end goal. And if the retailer keeps stocking, then wouldn't that eliminate the secondhand market as well? So there's something screwy where it's like, there's only like a limited number produced, which is feeding the entire secondary market at this point, which, you know, companies like NECA seem to detest, which is why they've stepped outside the box a few times as well. Well, it's easy for NECA to say stuff like, you know, don't pay these ridiculous prices, but, uh, you know, hardcore Turtle fans, they want Toka and Razor. They want their, their figures, right? And desperate times, man, I'm telling you, I've done it, you've done it, you know, gone on eBay when we can't get that one figure we really want a certain wave, or maybe it's, again, a Target exclusive in the States, and we pay double or triple. I've done it more than a few times, and I never feel good about doing it. Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned Toka and Razor from Secret of the U's, TMNT, and NECA, and that's an example where they said, yeah, don't pay this, and they actually put up a pre-order window saying, you've got a month to do this. If you want to pre-order this, we'll get it to you. It's going to take a while. Uh, we know that there are crazy scalpers going on, and we don't want that. We don't want you to have to pay two or three yeah. times for that. And I mean, that's because they would rather take your money the first time, and so you have more money to buy more figures. You know, that, that just adds up. But yeah, I've bought stuff off eBay. Your term eBay exclusive is, is genius because in Canada, sure, we have Toys R Us, but who knows when some of the stuff actually hits. Splinter and Baxter, like I mentioned earlier, hit at Christmas time in the US. And you know, here we are four, five, six months later in Canada, just to give everybody an idea of how long we wait for stuff to get shipped. It's still not here. Oh, it's imagination and creativity, right? I mean, when I picked up action figures as a kid, I was, I was creating my own worlds and, and coming up with my own stories and, and you know, my own battles between good and evil. And it's the same way. I see that now with my son. I have a five-year-old. And watching him pick up these toys doesn't matter what toy line they're from. He's picking them up and he's He's creating these narratives and these stories and he's playing with them together as, as their friends or their foes and they're fighting and just, he's imagining this whole world and it's, it's a creative process. It's absolutely amazing. For me, you know, the passion that I got from coming up with these stories and everything is what ended up driving me later in life. Uh, you know, coming up with the stories and getting excited about these toys ultimately ultimately led to me uh, being able to share my passion with the world on anything. Anything that I'm passionate about, I'm out there and I'm, I'm talking about it and it's easy to talk about because I'm excited about it. And so I think for kids being able to kind of develop that and, and get passionate about something and uh, realize that they are creating something and then they want to share what they created with other people is really important because maybe they will go on in life to come up with other things artistically or musically or whatever and they'll have that drive to want to share what they created with other people. You know, I, I, I think a lot of that comes from probably uh, our era, our childhood, um, because action figures became very prominent in the 80s specifically. Um, and all of our parents at the time referred to those as dolls. And when you think of dolls as a kid, you think of a Barbie or something like that. So I think for, for the little boys especially, it was, no, these aren't dolls. These are articulated action figures. These are for boys. And I think that's where that comes from. But I also think at this point in life, that's a bit antiquated. 
antiquated at this point because, um, you know, there's there's room for everybody to play with everything. And it doesn't matter if it's a doll or an action figure. If you care about it and you're having fun with it, that's what's important. Well, so it's definitely another thing where our generation grew up being so passionate about it, the amazing stuff that came out when, when we were kids. And uh, then our generation grew up and became the people making these toys, right? So we started doing the things we wanted when we were kids and marketing them to us, to our generation. Uh, so that's definitely where the adult collector thing comes from because our generation has made it so that toys are not just for kids anymore. Toys are for everyone and that's okay. I, it's it's really hard to predict the future uh, for how all this is going because I feel like right now, like the moment we're living in right now, we are coming out with some of the best representations of all of these characters that we've all loved from our childhood. Uh, you know, whether you are somebody that prefers the super detailed sculpts, the high articulation, or even just the more basic fun factor type toys, there's so many options out there now, no matter what the scale is. Um, so honestly, I think I think the future is just gonna keep progressing on, on that pattern. I mean, with every generation that grows up and the, you know, when the kids start getting older and they start getting into these careers, they're gonna be the ones doing the same thing we are and they're gonna start making the things that they wanted or that they remember. Um, so honestly, like, toys themselves are probably just going to, the trajectory is gonna be following that kind of plane there for what, what they remember and what they're fond of. Let's talk about another kind of exclusive, Jay, and that's the mail-away exclusive figure. Now, mailing away flag points or the equivalent isn't something that really happens nowadays. I can't even think of an example uh, where that is the case, but it was certainly prevalent growing up and especially in the 80s. What are your feelings and thoughts about mail-away exclusive figures? It brings me back to my childhood. Uh, mail-aways were awesome, it was always exciting. Collecting, let's reference Joe, you know, collecting flag points just to have enough to mail away for Duke or for Cobra Commander is really exciting. I, I think the last one you and I remember, at least the last one that I remember, was the Ghost of Obi-Wan from Star Wars, the, the relaunch, Power of the Force line, that was 1996. Remember that? It was, I think, Doritos chips, where there was just a little pamphlet you can grab from the variety store, and you just mailed that in, couple proofs of purchase and you had Ghost of Obi-Wan and that was so awesome. What I remember about that is it's showing up at your house and you're like, oh, I think it's here. And you open it and it's just like a little white box, not much bigger than the size of the three and three quarter, you know, Kenner mid nineties figures. And you took it out and it was basically like a translucent version of the regular figure, which we kind of <laughs> knew from the pictures. I remember looking at Toy Fair magazine, I think is where we first saw it or on the back of Doritos. And you're yeah. just like, uh. <laughs> it's kind of underwhelming. There was no like package art. There was nothing. It was just like in this like uncelebratory box yeah. that you're just like, uh, okay. Well, that familiar sound means it's time for action figure spotlight again. And this time, Jay, I'm gonna elect to go first, and that's because I'm excited about one of one of the few exclusives that I actually have in my collection. This is a. 2002 exclusive He-Man and the Masters of the Universe from the reboot attempt. There's a huge story behind how the 2002 line came, came to be basically the four horsemen who were working at McFarland Toys, went out, sat on their own, and they were teaming up with Mattel. They had a vision of He-Man, and this was kind of the vision of He-Man, which is what Mattel kind of wanted to do anyways, and so it was like serendipity. Both sides met at the same time, and to celebrate the line at Comic-Con, they had these exclusive figures. Now this varies compared to the original release, the standard release. One, the power sword is actually gold, and there's like some vac metal on the shield as well. The cool thing, and this is my favorite part about exclusives, on the back, it's actually numbered. So mine is numbered. 996 of a thousand and you can even says like the package says comic-con limited to one of a thousand up here so there's only a thousand of these bad boys uh, and they were at comic-con and i remember seeing this on the cover of toy fair magazine and them talking about what was going on and oh i was just like oh my god how do i get one of these and i never thought in a million years i would have got one let alone one in this condition it's one of my favorite iterations of masters of the universe and to have this i just 
it like is a collection piece for me. It'll be on the shelf forever. It'll truly define who I am going forward. So this is probably my favorite exclusive that I have in my collection. What do you have to showcase this week for Action Figure Spotlight? I don't have anything as cool as that. That is a pretty darn cool story. But I thought I would grab something that I still have that is actually from my childhood. Now this guy, this is my version one mail away of Sergeant Slaughter. Yes, the actual wrestler Sergeant Slaughter is a G.I. Joe figure. You could tell version one of uh, the colors, but he also has the G.I. Joe still on his leg, if you can see that there. The paint is just awesome. There were two real human characters that were made into actual Joes. Of course, one was Slaughter. The second was William Refrigerator Perry, who I believe he played for the Chicago Bears. I'm not too sure. But how cool is this guy to have an actual WWF wrestler now turned G.I. Joe, and you could only get him through Mail Away. Later on, there was a bunch of different versions of the Sarge that came with various vehicles throughout the line. But this was the very first one, and you can tell there's only a little bit of paint wear on his whistle, because I didn't play with him much because he had so many paint applications that would rub off, and you simply couldn't replace this one. So. That is my action figure spotlight. Oh man, you know I am a fan of Sergeant Slaughter, so mm -hmm. seeing version one, I only ever had version two when he came with his tank, I think the triple T. Yeah. Oh, so cool that, that you've got that. Unfortunately, now I gotta add it to my list and I don't think <laughs> I have enough flag points to get one yet. Uh, keep saving, buddy, keep saving. <laughs> 